Oh my goodness, everybody. Thanks so much for being here. It is so, so good to be on a stage in person. Again, I have missed this so much. And I think we all have from the amount of fun we've all been having so far in the conference. Like Penelope said, my name is Nick Means. I lead engineering at a company called SIM, where we're creating tools to empower engineering teams to build security and compliance workflows that fit the way that they already work. Uh, we're also hiring like everybody else here, so please come say hi if that sounds interesting. And uh, thanks to everybody at SIM for holding down the fort so that I could be here this week. I also co-host a podcast on engineering leadership called Managing Up. If you're a leader, whether you have an official title or not, the show is for you. I learn something literally every time we record. And I've got stickers, so come say hi if you'd like one. Now, I want to start off with a brief content warning. This talk contains stories of a couple of plane crashes, one of them pretty vivid. So if you're a nervous flyer already, this might not be the talk for you. Now, if you follow me on Twitter, you may know that I'm occasionally in a plane spotting, especially when I'm traveling. I love seeing planes that I've never seen before, like this weird little Avro RJ85 that I saw at London City Airport. It has four engines for reasons, even though it only carries about 100 people. Or special planes like Concorde BOAB that's just hanging out on the tarmac at London Heathrow for anyone to see if you're lucky enough to taxi out the right way. But I also really like identifying planes in the air. And one of the first ones that I learned how to spot reliably was the Boeing 737. Now, it's the best-selling commercial aircraft of all time, so it's everywhere. And once you know the trick, it's incredibly easy to identify this plane in the air. And the trick is that the 737 has no doors over its rear landing gear. So if you see two tires poking out of the bottom fuselage of a plane and it's too big to be a regional jet, it's a 737. You can see on this one coming in for landing how the gears swing out from the wheel-shaped cavities in the center of the fuselage. So why am I talking about plane spotting? Well, there's an interesting reason that the 737 doesn't have rear landing gear doors. And that reason has everything to do with the problems with the 737 MAX. We got the first hint that there was a problem with this plane with crash of Lion Air Flight 610 off the coast of Indonesia on October the 29th, 2018. This is, Boeing, this is the Boeing 737 MAX 8, registration number PK-LQP, that would operate Lion Air Flight 610 on October 29th, 2018. In this picture, the plane is at Boeing's Everett Washington delivery facility. It was taken on August 2018, just before the plane left on its final delivery voyage to Indonesia. That means that this plane was just over two months old on the day of the accident, basically still brand new. The captain for Flight 610 was Bavia Suneja, an experienced pilot with over 6,000 hours of flying experience, most of that in the cockpit of a 737. In the right-hand seat was Harvino, who went by just one name, uh, a thing that's fairly common practice in Indonesia. He was another experienced pilot with almost as many hours in the 737 as Suneja. Flight 610 was scheduled domestic service from Jakarta to Pangkal Penang in Indonesia, departing at 6.20 in the morning and scheduled to arrive 50 minutes later. Now, the easiest way to tell the story of Lion Air 610 is through data. This is the transcription of telemetry data from the plane's flight data recorder from the Indonesian NTSC's accident report. And it tells a really clear story, and let me walk you through it. First, to get you oriented, the timestamps here at the bottom are all 1 minute and 19 seconds apart. And the reason for this is because for some reason, they, decided, they divided this chart into 10 equal parts instead of the 12 minutes that the, the flight roughly lasted. Now, let me give us some more legible labels as well so we can kind of navigate this chart. And let's start with the moment the plane gets airborne. There's a couple of things here that immediately indicate that this plane's got a problem. First, as soon as the plane's in the air, the pilot's stick shaker starts shaking. Now, this is exactly what it sounds like. It's a vibration motor that literally shakes the yoke that the pilot is hanging on to. It is the most urgent warning indicator on the flight deck. It's there to really get the pilot's attention when the plane's about to stall. Now, in this context, a stall has nothing to do with the engines. It's referring to the wings and their ability to generate lift. When a wing is moving too slowly or too steeply through the air, vortices form on top of the wing, disrupting the smooth airflow that generates lift. Now, obviously, this is a bad thing in an airplane, and so when the plane senses it's at risk of this happening, it kicks on the stick shaker. The plane has just lifted off the ground and it's climbing smoothly. Why does the plane think it's about to stall? Even stranger, why is it only the pilot's stick shaker that's going off? In an actual stall, you would expect both of the yokes in the cockpit to be shaking. And the answer to both questions is a few lines down the chart. The angle of attack indicated on the pilot's instruments is about 20 degrees greater than the angle of attack on the co-pilot's instruments. Now, what is angle of attack? 
The plane's angle of attack is the angle at which the plane is moving through the air, and it doesn't always follow the nose. So when the plane's approaching a stall, the nose might be pointing up in the air, but the plane might actually be moving more perpendicular to the ground, parallel to the ground. Now, the plane senses angle of attack using a vane on each side of the aircraft, with each vane feeding the instruments on that side of the flight deck. On flight 610, the pilot's vane was malfunctioning, reading about 20 degrees steeper than the co-pilot's. This dis disagreement starts when the plane is still on the ground, and it lasts the entire flight. And so when it does take off, the plane immediately thinks that it's stalling. About two minutes into the flight, Harvino asks air traffic control for a clearance to some holding point. The controller quickly vectors him and then asks for a reason, to which he responds, we've got a flight control problem. For some reason, though, he doesn't declare an emergency. A minute later, having reached their hold point, Captain Suneja becomes concerned about the plane's flaps, the extensions of the wing to, to generate lift at lower speeds. He'd been ignoring them up to this point in the flight because of everything else going on, but now he notices that they're flying too fast to have the flaps extended, and so he retracts them. Almost immediately, the plane plunges 700 feet uncommanded. Now, if you're a roller coaster fan, this is about three times the main drop of a modern hypercoaster. So Nature finds himself pulling back on a suddenly very heavy yoke, and he has a good idea of what's happened. The plane is out of trim. And sure enough, there's a major nose down change in the trim reflected in the data. So what is trim? Well, let's take a look at the tail of the 737. At the back of the plane is this sort of mini wing called the horizontal stabilizer, and at the back of the horizontal stabilizer is the elevator. The elevator is the control surface that responds when the pilot pulls or pushes on the yoke to make some changes to, to altitude or to pitch. But it would be exhausting to sit there and pull back on the yoke for the entire climb phase of the flight. That's where trim comes in. If you look at the front of the horizontal stabilizer, you can see this metal track. The entire horizontal stabilizer, this entire mini wing, can angle up or down, and this is what trim adjusts. It serves as sort of cruise control for climbs and descents. Now, for some reason, the plane's auto trim had made a pretty dramatic adjustment to pitch the nose of the plane down, seen here in yellow. So Naja quickly provides a manual trim adjustment in blue to pull the nose back up, but a few seconds later, auto trim kicks in again to pull the nose back down. Now, there's an unwritten rule in aviation that when you make a change to the configuration of the plane, and the plane does something that you don't understand, you undo that change. And so that's what Suneja does. He doesn't understand why auto trim is kicked in, but he extends the flaps again and hopes that the auto trim will stop. And sure enough, it does. There are a few routine adjustments, but no more dramatic drops. But Suneja is still worried about his flaps. He knows that they can't complete the flight with them extended, and he's still planning on completing this flight. And so he retracts the flaps again. And almost immediately, he's fighting auto trim again. About this time, Harvino asks air traffic control for a return to Jakarta. The return's granted, but there's a few things that are strange about this. First, Harvino still doesn't declare an emergency. He's still proceeding as if this is a normal flight. Second, the controller doesn't ask Flight 610 if it wants to declare an emergency. Typically, if you're requesting a return to an airport, that's a question a controller would ask you. Instead of getting other planes out of the way and letting 610 focus on flying, air traffic control keeps giving them turns around other traffic that just complicates the work of trying to keep this plane in the air. So Naja would keep fighting the plane for the next six minutes while Harvino scoured the flight manual for something, anything, that might explain what was going on and how to fix it. For every auto trim activation, Suneja would counter with an equal burst of manual trim. And the trim, despite oscillating up and down, would average out mostly to even over the six minutes, and the same with altitude. Suneja was having to fight like hell, and it would have been terrifying to be in the back of the plane as it went up and down in 100 and 200 foot increments. But he's keeping the plane more or less at 5,000 feet. So finally, not sure what else to do with the beleaguer plane, Suneja gives the controls over to Harvino so that he can look through the flight manual himself and see if he can find anything that will help. But he's so flustered at this point that he neglects to tell Harvino what he's been doing to keep the plane level. The auto trim continues to activate. Harvino counters with a few short bursts of manual trim adjustment, but not nearly enough to counter the auto trim. And less than 30 seconds later, the plane has reached maximum nose down trim. Now at this point on the flight, uh, the cockpit voice recorder, Harvino can be heard reciting a verse from the Quran, asking God for a miracle. So is pulling back on the yoke as hard as he can, trying to pull this plane out of a dive, but it's too late. Flight 610 plunged 5,000 feet in 15 seconds, hitting the water at over 500 miles per hour and killing all 189 souls on board. An absolute tragedy. The world understandably wanted to know what happened. 
But the other airlines flying the 737 MAX needed to know what happened and if it could possibly happen to their brand new 737 MAXs as well. So eight days later, Boeing would send its first message to the plane's operators. Doesn't really say much though. Basically, just that the early information about Lion 610 indicated that there was an uncommanded nose down trim as a result of a malfunctioning angle of attack sensor. Now there's one problem with this. There's no documented system on the 737 MAX by which a malfunctioning angle of attack sensor could trigger nose down trim. It doesn't exist. And this bulletin doesn't clear that up at all. And so Boeing got so many questions about this that four days later they sent out another operator message. Now this message contained the first public acknowledgement of the now infamous Maneuvering Characteristics Augmentation System, or MCAS. This was the system that was responsible for the uncommanded trim on Lion Air 610. And if you followed the 737 MAX story at all, you've probably at least heard of it. So what is MCAS? Well, to answer that, we actually need to know a little bit about the history of the 737. 737 was launched by Boeing in 1967, 54 years ago. It's a really old plane. Now, 54 years ago, commercial aviation was still pretty young, and airlines wanted access to markets beyond the, the big cities with their large airports. Now, that meant that they needed a plane that could fly into smaller airfields that might not have jet bridges or baggage handling equipment. And so because of that, the 737 was built low to the ground so that ground crews could load and unload baggage directly from the ground without needing a conveyor or even a stepladder. And as you may have already figured out, this is why the 737 doesn't have rear landing gear doors. There just isn't room, it's too low to the ground. Now this low clearance became a problem as engine technology evolved. In the early 1980s, when Boeing wanted to update the 737's original low bypass engines with newer, more efficient high bypass turbofans, they had to find a way to fit the new, larger engines under the wings. This strange looking egg-shaped engine inlet was the result. It was the only way they could make it fit. And they used the same solution in the mid-90s, 15 years later, to create the 737 Next Gen. In addition to upgrading from manual to electronic displays on the flight deck, the 737 Next Gen squeezes a slightly more efficient engine under the wing using similar but not quite as dramatically shaped inlets. But the low clearance went from engineering challenge to real problem in 2011. A year prior, in 2010, Airbus had introduced the, the A320neo. Now, the 320 is the 737's closest competitor, carrying roughly the same 180 or so passengers along the same routes. The NEO, short for New Engine Option, was the first major revision of the A320 since its launch. It incorporated new CFM LEAP engines with a much higher bypass ratio that resulted in nearly 20% fuel savings over the older A320 and critically the 737 Next Gen. Now Boeing had long disregarded the competitive threat posed by Airbus and that continued with the NEO. They weren't too worried about it. Boeing was planning on designing a new plane from scratch for the 180 seat market and it assumed that its current customers would continue buying the 737 Next Gen until the new plane was ready. Well, Boeing CEO James McNerney got a rude awakening in a phone call from Air American Airlines CEO Gerard Arpey. American was preparing to make its largest ever aircraft order, 400 planes in all to replace its aging fleet of McDonnell Douglas MD-80s. Now, McNerney thought the deal was a shoe in because American's modern fleet was all Boeing. That was until RP called to let him know that American's first 200 planes would be a mix of A320s and A320neos from Airbus. It was a real kick in the pants. But there was some good news. Boeing could still compete for the other half of the order, but American wanted the same fuel economy as the A320neo, and it wanted it on the same five-year timeline that Airbus had promised. Now, to fully understand Boeing's response in this situation, we have to go back to 1997, when Boeing acquired McDonnell Douglas, another American aircraft manufacturer. Boeing, led by CEO Phil Condit, had long been an engineering-driven company with airplane people all the way to the top. McDonnell Douglas, on the other hand, was led by Harry Stonecipher, a graduate of Jack Welch's GE, heavily focused on maximizing shareholder value. Stonecipher came into Boeing as president and COO shortly after the merger, and he made his influence quickly felt. Boeing became much more focused on margins and on stock price. He also convinced Condit and the board to move Boeing headquarters from Seattle to Chicago, and he did this as a means of culture change. He wanted to give execs making business decisions more insulation from the engineers that might push back on those decisions. When Condit resigned as CEO in 2003 with Stonecipher taking over, Stonecipher had this to say in an interview. When people say I changed the culture of Boeing, that was the intent, so that it's run like a business rather than a great engineering firm. 
Now, this sounds rather innocuous on the surface, but this culture change had resulted in a growing win-at-all-costs environment inside Boeing. Condit's resignation was actually a result of this, forced out by stolen competitor documents and violations of government procurement laws that happened on his watch. McNerney, who took over from Stonecipher in 2005, just two years later, after Stonecipher's own ethical lapse, was cut from the same GE cloth. With Boeing's 787 Dreamliner project suffering from manufacturing delays and battery problems, the 737 was the only plane that Boeing was actually delivering in the early 2010s. Now, Boeing's stock price was already down at this point because of the problems with the 787. Americans threatened defection to Airbus, would drag it even lower, and might inspire other airlines to buy from Airbus as well. McNerney wasn't about to let this happen no matter what it took. And so three months later, the 737 MAX was born. Designing it was a frantic project inside Boeing with engineers working at double their normal pace. Boeing made some aerodynamic improvements and spec'd the exact same CFM Leap engines as the A320neo, exactly matching it on fuel efficiency. And the proposal worked. American ordered 737 MAXs to fill the rest of the order, but with one condition. The MAX had to be type rated with the current 737 Next Gen, meaning pilots who were qualified to fly the Next Gen wouldn't need expensive simulator training to fly the MAX. Southwest placed an order with the same condition, but they made it even stronger. They insisted on a $1 million rebate per plane if pilots needed simulator training to fly it. Now, CFM leap engines get their efficiency from a higher bypass ratio, and what this means is there's more space in the cavity of the engine around the core of the jet engine, and this allows more air to flow through it, generating more thrust. But the problem is, to accommodate this, CFM leap engines are bigger, a lot bigger. Common type rating wasn't a challenge for Airbus. It could just swap in the new engine with a few, with few other major changes. But because of how low the 737 sits to the ground, it wasn't nearly so straightforward to Boeing, for Boeing. Even with the sculpted inlet, the leap would still be too large to fit under the 737's wing. And so Boeing just worked around it. You can see here that instead of trying to fit the engine under the wing, they just moved it out in front of the wing. That gave them plenty of room for the, extra, for the bigger engine. Great workaround, but like most workarounds, it had drawbacks. They discovered the first one in early wind tunnel testing where in, a, in climbing a steep banked turn when the plane was close to stalling, the pressure the pilot felt on the yoke didn't match earlier 737 models because of all of the extra lift generated by the placement and more power of the engines. Now, this is a situation that a, a passenger plane would almost never be in, but it is required for certification, and critically, it has to match with the previous generation of the plane for a common type rating. Some engineers within Boeing advocated for an aerodynamic fix, actual physical changes to the plane, but that would delay the project by months. So instead, they reached for a software solution they just added to the KC-46, MCAS. On the, the, the KC-46, an air-to-air -air refueling tanker, MCAS is used to keep the plane's handling characteristics consistent as it offloads its fuel cargo when the plane's center of gravity changes. On the MAX, MCAS would adjust trim by just 0.6 degrees, nose down, in that one specific scenario just enough to mimic the control feel of prior 737s. It was at this point that Boeing made a critical decision. The FAA has long delegated non-critical parts of the airplane certification process to employees of the manufacturers themselves, focusing its scarce resources on digging into critical safety systems. Because of how rarely MCAS was expected to kick in, Boeing categorized potential MCAS failures as hazardous, but not catastrophic. Now, this is important because that let Boeing drive it, that let Boeing self-certify the feature, and it also let Boeing drive the operation with a single angle of attack sensor rather than the redundancy required for systems with catastrophic failure potential. But Boeing's test pilots would find another problem with the MAX once they got it into the air. We talked earlier about stalls when the wing of a plane loses lift. In previous versions of the 737, low speed stalls are pretty dramatic with lots of buffeting vibration as the plane approaches the stall and then a quick 30 degree nose down drop once the stall actually happens. When the MAX stalled, again because of the power and the placement of the engines, it was much less dramatic. Still some buffeting, but the nose only gently dropped by about 10 degrees. Now this handling difference would absolutely keep the MAX from achieving a common type rating. This is a much more common scenario that you would face in a plane. And so Boeing reached for MCAS again. This time, instead of 0.6 degrees of activation, they'd have MCAS quickly add 2.5 degrees of nose down trim as the plane stalled to get the desired quick 30 degree drop. Again, the solution worked great, making the MAX behave almost exactly like previous generations of the plane. 
Because MCAS had already been declared non-critical, and this activation was expected to occur only at low speeds when pilots had plenty of time to react, Boeing didn't update the safety analysis documentation it submitted to the FAA as part of the plane certification, despite the major new use case of MCAS. Boeing's chief technical pilot, Mark Fortner, was behind one of the most critical decisions about MCAS. Facing lots of pressure from the company leadership around type rating, he suggested that MCAS be intentionally omitted from the 737 MAX flight manual with the logic that it operated in the background and pilots would never actually directly interact with it. And the FAA actually agreed with this logic and allowed the omission. But the FAA's agreement didn't actually take into account the new low speed stall activation scenario because Boeing hadn't updated the safety analysis. And something seemingly nobody took into account was the possibility of MCAS activating repeatedly. The maximum adjustment of the 737's trim is 4.7 degrees. So it would take just two MCAS activations to get maximum nose down trim if the pilot didn't counter it with manual adjustment. Now, what's more, MCAS would pause for only five seconds between every manual trim adjustment before it kicked back in. All of Boeing's analysis was based on a single activation and assumed a pilot would be able to spot and address an erroneous activation in about three seconds. And the reason for this assumption was that MCAS activation is remarkably similar to another control problem that pilots do drill for, runaway trim. Now, in a runaway trim scenario, the auto trim of the plane starts adjusting trim to one extreme and it doesn't stop. It just continuously runs out until it hits the maximum activation. When this happens, these two wheels start spinning. These are the manual trim adjustment wheels and they're located on the console between the, the pilot and co-pilot in the 737. And they have the white marking on them specifically so that you can see them spinning. They would spin about 40 times in a 2.5 degree MCAS activation and even more in a runaway trim scenario. So in, in this situation, these wheels would just be sitting here spinning. And when this happens, recovery should be relatively straightforward. First, the pilot turns off the two stab trim cutout switches, disabling the electrical stabilizer trim of the plane altogether and reverting to complete manual control. Second, the pilot would pull back on the yoke to get the plane flying level again. And third, the pilot would use the manual trim wheels to set the plane back into trim for level flight and gradually release the pressure on the yoke. Now, we know Captain Suneja knew he had a trim problem on Lion Air 610 because he repeatedly countered MCAS's nose down adjustments with manual nose up trim. So why didn't he or the co-pilot ever hit the stab trim cutout switches? Well, pilot and aviation journalist William Longavisha argues in his New York Times Magazine article that it comes down to pilot training. Specifically, because the rapid rise of global aviation, there are more flight decks to fill than pilots to fill them. Airlines like Lion Air have had to scale up their own pilot training academies and train pilots in a hurry just to keep their planes in the sky. Langavish's assertion is that pilots trained this quickly learn by rote rather than experience and graduate knowing how to do the steps to fly a plane but not what to do when things go out of certain narrowly defined scenarios. The stunning 95% graduation rate of Lion Air's training academy would seem to back up this lack of rigorous training. That's an absurdly high graduation rate from a pilot academy. As would the fact that Indonesia, with one of the fastest growing aviation sectors in the world, has more than 15 times more passenger fatalities per million flights than the global average. And so the theory goes that because the situation presenting itself to Suneja and Harvino didn't precisely match anything they'd been trained in, because MCAS pulsed on and off instead of being continuous like a runaway trim event, they didn't have the base aviation knowledge or instincts to know what to do. The situation would repeat itself less than five months later on Ethiopian Airlines Flight 302. Now notably, this is after Boeing published the bulletins on MCAS, so the pilots would have been fully aware of the situation. Again, a malfunctioning angle of attack sensor meant that the pilot's stick shaker was operating basically the whole flight, and MCAS kicked in as soon as the pilots retracted the flaps on the plane. Now the Ethiopian pilots actually did hit the stab trim cutout switches, but they had to turn it back on because the aerodynamic load on the horizontal stabilizer was so great that they couldn't manually adjust the trim. They were gonna turn it back on, get the plane trimmed again, and turn it back off. But in the time they tried to do that, MCAS activated again, and they crashed shortly thereafter, again, killing everybody on board. Now, the second crash led to a worldwide grounding of the 737 MAX in scenes like this of undelivered 737 MAX planes parked at Boeing's plant in Renton, Washington. So why did this happen? Was it Boeing's fault for the way that they added MCAS to the 737 MAX? Or the FAA's fault for not more closely certifying it? Was it the pilot's fault for not recognizing and recovering from the MCAS failure? Or does it go all the way back to the Boeing-Douglas merger and the resulting culture change at Boeing? 
Well, in her fantastic book, Thinking in Systems, Donella Meadows gives us some great tools to pick apart the situation using systems thinking. In the book, Meadows introduces the concepts of stocks and flows. Stocks are the foundational units of a system, the thing that you can count and measure. They move slowly, taking time to react to changes in the system. Flows are the things that increase or decrease those stocks. She uses the analogy of water in a bathtub, where the water in the bathtub is a stock, and the spigot is the flow that can increase the amount of that stock, and the drain being the, the influence that can reduce the amount of that stock. And there are feedback loops as well in the system that affects, affect the rate of flows. Now, this modeling rabbit hole can go pretty deep, so I'm gonna keep this as simple as I can, which you will laugh about in a minute. The stock that we're gonna consider in this system is safety. Now, it's hard to quantify, but the bathtub analogy sort of makes sense here in that if you think about it, there's things that make safety in the system go up and go down, and it's kind of an overall measurement. The clouds are the boundaries of our system. We're not gonna think about where safety comes from and where safety goes to, but instead, what affects the rate of increase and decrease of safety in the system? We're never gonna be able to get rid of everything that decreases safety in the system, so the goal is to keep the rate of increase high enough to make up for the decrease. Now let's start with pilot training. We know that safety in the system increases the quality of pilot training, and that quality of pilot training increases the flow of safety into the system. It's, it's a positive feedback loop. But we also know that the increasing safety of air travel has been a major factor in increasing the amount of travel, just the number of people flying every year. And more travel means that more pilots are needed. And that demand for pilots negatively impacts the training quality, resulting in a decrease in safety in the system. The increased amount of travel also increased the number of planes needed by airlines every year. Now, this has a couple of effects. First, it has a positive influence on the rate of technological advance because more planes sold makes it easier to recoup those investments. And by and large, those advances have a positive influence on safety. The increasing number of planes needed also created an economic environment ripe for consolidation because there were opportunities for cost savings and volume. This consolidation caused dilution of Boeing's culture of engineering excellence. And the safety in the system contributed to it, making it feel safe to dial back engineering excellence just a bit in the name of profit. And we know from earlier that this caused a decrease in safety as well. And finally, the increase in planes needed in the market increased competitive pressure. Boeing had to play catch up with Airbus. That put pressure on Boeing to increase design speed, and again, they felt doing, safe doing this because of the safety in the system. But we know that this reduced design quality and that in turn decreased the safety of the system. And lastly, the amount of safety in the system made it possible for Congress to tell the FAA to increase the amount of certification delegation that it was doing. That meant, among other things, missing the change to MCAS, clearly decreasing safety. Like I said, simple. Now, if you'll notice, every feedback loop in this system is rooted in the safety already in the system. So what does that mean? That safety caused the problems with the 737 MAX? And Actually, the answer, in a way, is yes. In the intro to Thinking in Systems, Meadows says everyone or everything in a system can act dutifully and rationally, yet all these well-meaning actions too often add up to a perfectly terrible result. And that's what happened here. Every actor in the system, buoyed by the safety of modern aviation, borrowed a little bit of safety to optimize something else. And it is a balance, if you think about it, because the only way to achieve perfect safety in aviation is not to fly at all. Now, most of these choices they made were reasonable given their incentives and motivations, and yet the cumulative effect of their actions in the system was tragedy. And this is the lesson for us. If we only pay attention to the events around us, to the actions of individuals, not to the system as a whole, we'll struggle to understand why we're getting the results that we're getting. In practical team terms, if your team is struggling to ship, and you start trying to get individuals on the team to work harder without understanding what about the system is slowing them down, you're just gonna burn everybody out. Or if there's an incident and you focus on who did what without paying attention to the why, you're not likely to learn anything. You'll probably just repeat it again. And you don't need to be in a leadership role to have this orientation. Anyone can bring it to the table. All of life is systems. And growing your ability to see and think in terms of systems will pay huge dividends in your ability to achieve the things that you want. And let me leave you with a positive note about the 737 MAX as well. Systems tend to be adaptive and interested in their own survival, and that's true here as well. In the wake of the two crashes, during the grounding of the MAX, a few things have happened. First, 
the decrease in safety in the system caused Congress and the FAA to rethink its approach to delegation. Specifically, Manufacturers can no longer self-certify a novel or unusual design feature, and the FAA now has to approve individuals that manufacturers delegate certification authority to. This should increase the safety in the system. The crash has also had an impact on design speed and quality at Boeing, both directly and indirectly via changes to FAA delegation and certification. The 737 MAX was grounded for one year and eight months while Boeing revised the MAX to get it right, taking the time they probably should have in the initial design phase. Now, other problems with software and wiring were found and fixed in the course of recertification as well, clearly improving safety. The version of MCAS now active on the MAX can only activate once in a stall event and only if the pilot and co-pilot angle of attack sensors are in agreement. And finally, the crash has pointed out that pilots actually do need simulator training to fly the 737 MAX, a positive impact on training quality further increasing safety in the system. So the system has balanced itself, it has corrected in, in the wake of these tragedies. Now, odds are at least one person in this room is flying home on a 737 MAX, and I, I don't want to leave you anxious about that. So if that's you, don't worry. The MAX has gotten so much scrutiny at this point, it might actually be the safest plane in the air. Now as you go, good luck learning to see and influence the systems operating all around you. It is your path to achieve real change. Thanks so much for coming. <laughs>